Hello everyone, Bill After down here in After's Alley. It is September 18th, 2017, and as you all know, we lost one of the great legends of all time uh, on September 17th, 2017, and that was Bobby the Brain Heenan. And as you know, when you read the magazines, and if you lived anywhere in the, uh, the Midwest, that Bobby Heenan's really greatest days before he became a broadcaster we're talking about with WWE and all the stuff that they did with him but the formative days of his greatness were in the AWA and right now we have uh, the man who is the son of the man who started it all in the AWA Vern Gagne's son Greg Gagne welcome down to the after chat thank you Bill for having me on today and talk about one of the greatest managers that ever lived, if not the greatest. In fact, he is the greatest that ever lived. Now, when did he first come to the AWA? Oh, God. Uh, it was around 1970, 71? 75, 76. I think he was in here before that. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. Wrestled, he wrestled out of Indianapolis for Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder. And... Uh, he was in Chicago quite a bit, but they were co-promoters with Bruiser and, and uh, Snyder and Vern. So he worked mostly out in Indianapolis, but he did work AWA matches in Chicago. When he came in here full-time, he came in with uh, Nick and Ray. Uh, I think that was about 19, I want to say 75, 76. Okay, by the way, for you people for you people who don't know, that's Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens. Okay, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Yep. That's okay. You know, I just figure everybody knows them. There's a lot of millennials that follow the after chat here. So. Oh, really? Yes. Millennials? Well, they're Thank into you. the Rollins and, and those guys, aren't they? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm not. All right, well, we'll do that on another after chat. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to do that another time. Right. We will, but tell, it, tell us about the first time you met Bobby Heenan? Well, the first time I had first experiences with him was uh, Jim and I wrestling uh, uh, Ray Stevens and Nick Bachman going at a TV that, match. That's Jim, Brun that's that Jim Brunzel, by the way, the High Flyers. Go ahead. It, all right. <laughs> interrupting me and I'll lose my whole train of thought here. We'll never get this interview done. I want them to know who we're talking about. I know, and I forget. I assume everybody it's okay. knows it's that. It's all right. Jim Brunzel and I had a, a tag team form that uh, was pretty successful in the AWA. Um, anyhow, we had a TV match against those two, and that's the first time that Bobby Heenan showed up to manage them. And they did quite a number on us that night. And we had a, a good match with them, and we had them on the ropes, and uh, a little interference from Bobby Heenan. And uh, Ray came off the top rope on my back. I think I had the sleeper hold on Nick and broke my ribs. Wow. And uh, they, kicked, uh, they threw Jim over the top rope, and they were kicking the crap out of me. And thank God uh, Larry Henning was around at the time, Larry the Axe Henning, the father of Kurt Henning for the millennials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> grandfather uh, of Curtis Axel. <laughs> oh, the grandfather of Curtis Axel. Yes, yeah. of course. Uh, and 16 grandchildren, and I don't know how many, you know, we hear all that from Larry when he's around. Right. But he came to my aid, and, and he was actually uh, friends with Bachman Clint Stevens, but he pulled him off, and one of them took a shot at him, and, and the rest was history with him. But that was my first experience with Bobby, and then, of course, down the road, had a lot of experiences with him. And, you know, he was quite an individual. Um, he was so different than any other manager in wrestling yeah. because he not only managed, but he also wrestled. But when my father was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in Chicago, Blackjack Lance and Blackjack Mungan were inducted that evening too. Yeah. And Bobby Heenan was their manager. and He made those two individuals and made them as a team. And I was really a little ticked off because we were on after them and not once did Lanza or Mulligan acknowledge what Bobby had done for them. And Bobby was such a special talent that I, I opened up before I even introduced her and I said, you know, um, I want to say one thing about Bobby Heenan. He was the greatest manager that ever lived in professional wrestling. He not only made like Blackjack Lanza and, uh, and Blackjack Mulligan he made anybody, but everybody he managed 
but he also made the opponents that they wrestled. And there was nobody else that could do what he did. And then when you got him in the ring, I mean, uh, he was, uh, you know, he got the crap beat out of him, but, you know, he gave the people what they wanted to see. He, um, he, he was a special talent, a special talent. So, the, the great wit of Bobby Heenan, we know that he's, uh, uh, he's done many, many things that made everybody inside the business, outside the business laugh. Uh, what about a, 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 a story where Bobby well, Heenan... Was, I got a couple of them. One, when he was managing Andre the Giant. And um, they're, doing a, they're doing an interview, and, you know, Andre didn't like to do interviews too much and, yeah. and talk, but, uh, you know, because of his size, the guy doing the interview, and Bobby Heenan said, he says, uh, Andre, what, like, what do you eat for dinner? And Bobby says, villagers. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> great, great line. Great line. Isn't that a great line? Those are the kind of one-liners. He was like that in a young man. Yeah, absolutely. Ronnie Dangerfield, you know, he was, he was that kind of guy. As we'd come back, uh, Denver was a, I keep going back to Denver, but when we wrestled in Denver Friday nights, we had to fly back early in the morning to get to Minneapolis to do our TV tapings, and then we'd either fly to Chicago or Milwaukee for the Saturday night uh, Sunday events. And um, Bobby used to sit in the back of the airplane with Ray or whoever, whoever he was managing, he'd get back there with them. And when they get on the plane, and the, the flight from Denver to Minneapolis was an hour and 45 minutes. And um, just before takeoff, Bobby and his guys would get up and use the, the bathrooms in the back and then sit back down. And at that time, they served meals, so we had breakfast on the plane, and we had a real nice breakfast. So when Bobby actually would get in the bathroom, he'd come out, and he had a little, I don't know what he had, but he could lock the doors from the outside. So when everybody walked back to go to the bathroom, it would say, you know, uh, facility in use. Yes. And we'd be sleeping, and all of a sudden, you'd people standing in the bump in your arm, you'd look up, and the line would be half, you know, halfway down the plane. <laughs> and then the pilot would announce, you know, breakfast is going to be served, everybody take their seat. You know, and all of them have had a cup of coffee, a couple of cups of coffee in them already, oh, and they're trying Jesus. to get back to the bathroom. So they sit down, and you can see heads turning back and looking back. We're trying to figure out what's going on. We didn't know what he had done. And uh, then after breakfast was served, or when the, when the gals would get past him with the cart, he would get up and the other guys go back into the bathroom, come back out, and he'd lock them again. Oh, jeez. So once breakfast was over, everybody's up, and the line would be three quarters of the way down the plane now, and nobody can get in the bathroom. <laughs> so then the pilot says, we're gonna land in Minneapolis, take your seats. So they'd take their seats. When that door opened, Bill, it was, you could see panic in people's face. They were running for the bathrooms. Oh, I can imagine. I can and imagine. And then we found out what he had done, and he would do that every month when we flew back from Denver. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He people. And Unbelievable. They, you know, that was the funniest thing in the world. Unbelievable. You know, but that was the kind of stuff, the pranks that he would, he would, he would uh, like to pull on people. So he eventually became the brain, but he he actually was uh, nicknamed the Weasel in AWA, wasn't he? Yes, he was. You know, it was amazing. Last night, 2.30 um, in the morning, I get a text message from Stephanie McMahon. It, it said, I just saw the Weasel suit match with you and Bobby Heenan, and it was an absolute classic. Wow. So they must be doing something tonight on, on Raw for him. But... Uh, and I know Wally Carbo, one day I went to him and I said, you know, everybody calls this guy a weasel. And I said, you know what? He's interfered in so many of our matches. Why not? I'd like to get him in a match, a weasel suit match. Or if I can't beat him in 10 minutes, you know, I'll put it on. And Wally says, hey, pal, what's a weasel suit? And I said, I have no idea <laughs> what a weasel looks like. But I said, you know, it's got paws and it's four feet and a tail. So Wally scratches his head, and the next thing I know, he comes with this white furry suit with vinyl on the feet and on the paws, and with a big tail on it. His Polish suit maker made it for him. Unbelievable. So he said, I got the weasel suit match, so he booked it. And um, 
I was fortunate enough to beat Bobby with just a couple seconds left. And then he didn't want to put the suit on. And uh, he was stomping around and kicking the ropes. And finally he took a swing at me and I ducked and put the sleeper on him. Put him out and the referee and I stuck him in that weasel suit. <sighs> and when he came to, and we had 20,000 people in the Civic Center, that place went bananas. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, I talked to a radio announcer in Minneapolis City who was there, and he said, I've never heard a roar like that in my life. And his reaction to having that suit on was second to none. I mean, it was fabulous. I remember the. And, I remember one of our photographers uh, took photos of that, and we ran that in the magazines a hundred times. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah it, was, it was a classic. Yeah, it certainly was. What, um, uh, what was the great chemistry between Bobby Heenan and Nick Bockwinkle that you saw because every time I photographed their matches and interviewed them there was a chemistry like they were uh, they were one brain I know it you know I, I you know some people you know you just connect with and uh, Nick you know he was such a great technician in the ring yeah but Nick didn't have a lot of charisma and Bobby brought the, brought the charisma out of Nick that he that he didn't right. show I guess right I, I, I mean that's the only thing I can think of because they really gelled and they were dynamic together and then when you threw Stevens with Nick later on or before that it just it was phenomenal yeah the chemistry that those three had absolutely and eventually absolutely. when Pat Patterson came in with Ray yeah. and Nick I mean with uh, with Ray and Pat tagged up with Bobby in their corner, it just gelled. They put Bobby Duncan with Blackjack Lanza. He made them instant. I mean, no matter who you put with Bobby Heenan, he could draw out the best out of those people and bring the best out of them. And whatever they lacked for drawing power, he gave it to them. Uh, I guess that, but you know, these guys are all superstars. They all drew a lot of money. Yeah. But with them, it put them over the top. And um, that was, that's what he brought to all those people. Um, yesterday when I interviewed Mean Gene Okerlund, my final question was the same final question I'm going to ask you. Is that if you wrote a book about Bobby Heenan, and you were finishing the book today, and you had to title that book about Bobby the Weasel, the Brain Heenan, what would the title of that book be? Well, for me, it would be The Weasel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, um, and I don't know, I don't know, because that's, in, in our era, in the AW, and I think when he first came to the WWE, they called him The Weasel, but he wanted to be called The Brain. Yeah. I mean, that was his stamp. Um, you know, would the book sell if you put, you know, The Brain? Bobby the Brain Heenan? I don't know. Well, I it, think people it, it, would relate to Bobby the Weasel Heenan. Yeah, it all depends. He, you know, it, more, I, you know I, I don't know what you would call the title. You're better at that than I am. You're a writer. No, no, but I... What would, I, you, what would you call it? What would you say? Wow. Let me ask you. I'm going to ask you a question. You ask me, and I got, you get the wow from me. Well, I've, I saw this from... Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Nick Houseman from Russell Zone uh, that wrestling has lost its brain. The Bobby Heenan oh, story. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I might that's call fantastic. it. That's yeah, fantastic. That's fantastic. I think that, so. That, is. that was Nick Houseman. By the way, I promised uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, video correspondents, uh, Big Ray Hernandez, that I would ask you that uh, story about the weasel suit because he uh, he always remembered that. Oh God, it was. Well, I guess every, a lot of people, they still ask me about it, you know, so it really, uh, it really made an impression on everybody, but, you know, that's what they thought of him. I, I, I've got, I've got one last, last question. What did your dad, Vern Gagne, think of Bobby Heenan? Well, he thought he was the greatest that ever, the greatest manager and performer that ever stepped in the ring. Well, boy, that I really mean, says something. He, yeah, I mean, he was, I mean, for his style. And for his personality, nobody could do the brain, the weasel, whatever you wanted to call him, better than he could, because that was him. Yeah, yeah. 
and All there right. was nobody in the business that could duplicate him. There isn't. You can't take another. You can name any manager you want, and they could not hold Bobby Heenan's jockstrap. Okay, nice way to wrap that up. Greg Gagne, September eighteenth, two thousand seventeen. Here with Bill Apter, and we're remembering Bobby the Weasel, the Brain Heenan. Thank you, Greg Gagne. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it.